Broken Homes is a podcast for musicians and artists alike. My name is Mark. And I'm Renegade. And we're going to talk with folks about anything from new releases to tour stories. The good, the bad, and the worse. Thanks for tuning in. Okay, so this episode of Ragged Bones is a special one. We have the man who raised me, my father, here. Say hello, father. Hi there, father. <laughs> <laughs> um, instead of uh, artist and musician stuff, today is going to be an interesting one. Paranormal stories. Yeah, <laughs> it's got some paranormal stories. So do you want to start off just with your name and let everybody know where, where you're stationed, where your home base is, I guess? Yes, my name is Andy Passion. I'm Mark's dad, as he said. And I'm living here in Green Valley, Arizona, close to where Mark and Ran are in Tucson. And uh, it's really good to be able to see them whenever we can. And here we are talking about some of the stuff that happened in the past. Mm -hmm. So, Father, uh, do you have any book releases or recent writings or anything going on? Well, a couple years ago, I wrote a book about the experiences that I've had since I was just a little boy. And um, they've pretty much continued my whole life until about the time I moved here to Arizona. It kind of all stopped. Yeah, the book is called The Most Haunted Man in America, and you can find it on Amazon, actually, as an e-book for your, um, like, for your Kindles, like, yeah. EPUB, we'll things like sure that. We'll make sure to put links to, to that book in the description of this episode. So what's the, what's the craziest story you can think of? What's the most, uh, the, that listeners here would just chills creeping up their spine kind of thing oh, they can think of. Uh, there are so many, so oh, yeah. many really crazy ones. Some of the ones that I think really unsettled me the most. Um, well, I can think of one time, one morning I was driving to work, and um, I came down to the bottom of the hill that uh, we used to live up on the Rainier Street um, mm-hmm. house. You remember that house well. Yep. Coming down the Cora Street to the bottom of the hill, and I was going to take a left to go into town, and I just happened to glance over at, and then this is like 5 o'clock in the morning. It was really early, before really any of the businesses were open, and I glanced left towards uh, the gas little gas station that was there on the corner, and just out of the corner of my eye, I saw what, what uh, was very clearly a man in military f- fatigues. He was just standing by the gas pumps. And uh, as I glanced over that way, looking towards traffic, um, I could just see him kind of lower his head and kind of just looked at me like right underneath his eyebrows. And he gives me this real weird smile. Um, It's real creepy, creepy. real (laughs) creepy smile. And then I turned right. Uh, I turned my head right to make sure no traffic was coming, and I thought, you know, it hit me. Wow, that was really creepy, and I turned back, and he was gone. Um, Uh And there was nowhere he could have gone, and the building was still closed up, so he couldn't have gone inside. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, and and just before I had turned my head, he raised his hand in the air and waved at me. (gasps) And uh, I have no clue who this guy was. I've never seen him before or since. And why he would just stand there smiling at me, you know. I, I don't I don't know. Yeah, that is weird. Uh. Um, another time I was on my way walking early one morning, and uh, I could hear somebody jogging behind me, coming towards me, and he was getting, I could hear him, his feet crunching in the gravel. Mm-hmm. He was getting closer and closer and closer, but the whole time he's breathing like he's got some horrible lung disease. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could hear this... <sighs> Ah, sound and mm-hmm. I'm thinking, oh man, this this is somebody that shouldn't be out jogging. Yeah. He's really, really <laughs> yeah. sick. And just as this thing got right to where it was going to knock, I f- thought it was going to knock me over. I stepped aside to let him pass me, and nobody was there. Ah. And no, no other sounds, nothing. Dead silence. Oh, that is so weird. <laughs> I would have chills. <laughs> yeah, well, things like that no. have happened since. I don't know, I was about eight years old when it started in Seattle in a little house. Wow. What's the first thing you think you would have? Well, the first thing that happened was uh, with my mom and dad and my brothers in Seattle. We were just moving out of a house. I was about eight years old and um, seven years old, maybe. And we were just moving out of a house to go uh, move into another house across, well, not across town, but several blocks away. And um, nothing had ever happened, but... We were packing up. 
to leave and uh, my dad had borrowed a pickup truck and we were loading it and this was uh, back in the days where this house you had to in order to to lock it to leave you had to actually stick a key in the door manually lock it mm -hmm. there wasn't any like we have nowadays you just lock the doorknob mm -hmm. this was an actual key in the door lock and so my mom locked the house and we left and took the load over and got back about, I would say about a half hour later. And when we pulled up, all the house lights were on, all the doors were just wide open. And my Whoa. dad was like angry and said to my mom, I thought you locked the, the house. Mm -hmm. And mom said, I did. It was locked up tight and all the lights were off. And my dad was thinking, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just figured she forgot. And so... Um, we loaded up another load, and she locked the door, and we left. We came back. It was the same exact thing. Whoa. All the lights were on. All the doors were open, and my dad was really mad. And uh, he he was thinking, okay, this time I'll do it myself. If you want to do something right, you got to do it yourself. <laughs> so he closed all, turned off all the lights. He manually locked the doors, and we left. When we came back again, same thing. All the lights were on. Wow. All the doors were open. And my dad knew, okay, that couldn't have been a mistake. That really happened. And then we left that house. And and uh, that was the only thing that ever happened in that house. Dang. But the house we moved into is where it all started. Oh, no. I was about to say, well, at least you guys were moving out of the house. but it's Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, it all started there. Mm. Um, I mean, in the very first thing, um, it was me and my brothers were in our bedrooms. There was two in each bedroom. And uh, we would hear at night footsteps coming up and down the hall outside the bedroom. And we would hear, like, the doorknobs start to move, like somebody was coming in. And we thought, you know, Mom and Dad might be playing a trick. We don't know. But then we started to hear conversations in the house, voices what? at night. Yeah, it was oh, like so weird. two or three voices, and they were like, one would say something, second person would answer third person might talk the first person and we'd go back and forth but it was one of those things where we would try to strain really hard to hear what they were saying but we could never really hear and make out what they were saying and it would terrify us and we would go to my mom and dad and you know freaking out that there's something something's going on in this house what's going on and mm -hmm. they would always go oh go back to sleep you were just dreaming you're fine knock it off but we knew because we would lay there terrified. Um, but then came the things that happened that convinced both of them that, okay, something's happening in this yeah. house. What happened? And, uh, well, <laughs> I'm dying to know. For, for my dad, it was uh, one time when we ran out of oil because the house was, was heated with oil. It wasn't uh, an electric furnace. It was an oil furnace. And we ran out of oil and couldn't get any until Monday. So we had to go the weekend without. And it was in the middle of winter, so Ooh. things were really cold. And so my dad said, well, we got to keep the, the oven on during the night because it, we have to have some heat, some kind. But we can't just leave it unattended. So he said that, okay, that Mom and I will take turns staying up and... We'll just make sure the house doesn't burn down. Yeah. <laughs> so Dad took the first shift and sat in the kitchen reading a book, and he's just sitting there with the oven, and he could all of a sudden, he heard footsteps coming up the back, uh. the back porch, up the steps, and he heard the doorknob, the back doorknob go rattle, <gasps> rattle, and he's thinking, somebody's trying to get in this house. That is not good. And he's thinking, I'm going to catch him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and I'm going to nail whoever this is because you're not getting in my house. Mm -hmm. So he grabs a baseball bat or something, whatever it was he grabbed, and he goes to the back door and very quickly or very quietly unlocks it and throws the door open. And not only is there no one there, but there's no footprints in the snow. Oh, my gosh. And uh, that freaked him out, and something's going on here. And then not too long after that, my mom had her experience where she was staying home with my youngest brother, who was still a baby at the time. He wasn't in school yet. And she spent her time uh, doing housework and watching her favorite daytime TV shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was just sitting there, and she heard the doorknob, the front doorknob start to rattle like somebody's trying to get in, and she was 
scared, so she went and looked out the out the window, and there wasn't anybody there. And so as she's looking out, she heard the back door, like somebody's trying to open oh, it. No. And that freaked her out, you know. I'm alone with a baby. Mm-hmm. And so she ran through the house, looked out the, the back curtains, and nobody's there. And as she's looking out the back, the front, oh, the do- front door oh knob rattles. God. So that scared her so bad, and she thought, I don't know what else to do. So she called my dad at work and said, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. So I think somebody's trying to get in the house, but I can't ever see him. And so my dad said, it's probably just the neighbor kids. All you got to do. Stand by the front windows. Soon as the the doorknob rattles, move the curtain aside and catch whoever it is. And when you see which neighbor kid it is, we're going to talk to their parents. So my mom waited right there. And sure enough, the doorknob starts moving. Rattle, mm-hmm. rattle, rattle. Somebody's trying to get in. She swings the curtains aside, and no one's on the porch. That is weird. And as she stood there thinking, okay... I don't know what's happening, but there's nobody here. All of a sudden, all of the dishes in the kitchen cupboards start to rattle. (gasps) And it gets louder and louder and louder and violently rattling. Oh, my God. And so she, if I recall what she has said over the years, she picked up my brother and said, I'm getting out of the house. I'm not coming home until Dad comes home. I'm not coming back. And uh, that's when they realize some, something is happening here. When we were kids, I remember one time you guys said something along the lines of uh, um, shuffling up in Steven's room. And, and, oh, yeah. And, well, so what's that story? Because I, I, I was too young. I don't really remember any of this stuff. So. Well, if you remember that room at all, yeah, it had this uh, closet that was built into the, into the wall with mm-hmm. a sliding wooden yeah. wooden door and yeah. that thing was warped and it was really really Heavy hard hard, yeah. hard to move that thing because it, it was warped in the track that mm-hmm. it was in um, and it took a great bit of effort to open that and mm-hmm. one night it was about I don't know two or three o'clock in the morning I heard right above it because that bedroom was right above our bedroom and I heard I woke up to uh, shuffling around like moving boxes and digging through stuff and I'm thinking what in the world is Stephen doing up there at mm-hmm. 2 o'clock in the morning? So I went up there to tell him to knock it off. You're keeping me awake. Yeah. And I went up there, and I opened his bedroom door, and he was fast asleep, laying there. And I'm thinking, you can't fall asleep that quick. Mm-hmm. Are you being funny? So I went over, and I shook him. And I said, Stephen, Stephen. And he opened his eyes, and he said, what? And I said, what are you doing up here? Mm-hmm. He said, sleeping. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, no, no, I mean, were you just up? Mm-hmm. And he said, no, I was sleeping. And I thought, that's weird. But then I noticed that that sliding closet, was the door was open. And so I went over there and I wrenched on that thing and got it closed. Mm-hmm. And I told him, keep this thing closed. Because it sounded like you were digging around up here. Mm-hmm. And he just kind of blew me off and went back to sleep. And I went back to bed. And probably, I don't know, 20 minutes later, 15, 20 minutes later, I hear the shuffling again. Moving around, boxes moving. And I was thinking, okay, this time I'm going to catch him. I know it's him. So I sneaked up the stairs so he couldn't hear me coming. And I really quietly opened his bedroom door. And he was sleeping. But that sliding door was open. Oh, weird. And that's not something he could have just done without a lot of effort. Mm-hmm. And then he wouldn't have been able to go right back to sleep right after that. So I knew that wasn't him. It wasn't him doing that it. That is so weird. Yeah. And believe it or not, Mark, you were actually um, indirectly part of one of the things that happened. No way. Yeah. Back in the in the days when you just started to learn to play the guitar, I mean, just barely playing oh. it. Um, you know, you were struggling like anybody does trying to learn the guitar, and there was a lot of clunking, clunkers, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know, stuff like that. Just really mm-hmm. initial learning. And one day, I came home from work, and uh, came in the in the house and sat down in the living room, and your mom and your sister in law Sarah were just sitting there talking, making dinner. And uh, as I was just relaxing, I could hear from your bedroom the guitar strumming. Mm-hmm. And 
it was a little bit better than you had been doing, and I'm sitting there listening, and pretty soon I spoke up, and I said, hey, Mark's actually sounding pretty good in there. <laughs> and your mom said, yeah, he's been uh, practicing for probably about an hour. What? And I thought, oh, cool, you've been listening to it for an hour? And she said, yeah, it's, it's actually, he's doing good. And I thought, cool. A few minutes later, you know, she, she says, okay, dinner's ready. So I go over to your bedroom, and I say, Hey, Mark, dinner time. Knock, knock, knock. And when I knocked, the guitar stopped. But you didn't come out of the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mark, dinner's ready. And you didn't, still didn't answer. So I opened the door to tell you, and you weren't even home. That's weird. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Your guitar was in, in its uh, guitar stand. I slept in that room. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. And uh, to this day, I have no idea how you can hear wow. the guitar playing for about an hour mm -hmm. and you weren't there. That is weird. Yeah. So lots of things have happened over the years. Yeah. I had a uh, an experience where I can't explain it, but it was the closest to what I expect was a Bigfoot. Wow. Yeah, I was coming out of the Yakima River Canyon with your mom and... You know, that thing must have been seven and a half feet tall. <gasps> and it was just watching us drive by and freaked us out. Weird. And I wanted to go back. And uh, so we did. I, I did a U-turn and mm -hmm. we circled back. And it wasn't there when we went back. Wow. But it was really, really weird. Yeah, that's the only other strange thing that I've ever happened other than the ghost stuff. <laughs> I remember you and Brooklyn, uh, your sister, trading bedrooms because you had been freaked out by something that happened. No way. I don't yeah. Know um, you told me about the time that, um, actually two two instances. One of the times was you had some type of a great big jar full of coins and that you heard it rattle and then like it overturned and spilled out all over the floor. Do you remember that? Uh-uh, I do not remember that. And that really spooked you. Really? And then one other night when you went to bed and you turned off your lamp. Oh, and I remember the lamp. you woke up not too awful long later with that lamp on and on the floor in the middle of the bedroom. Oh, that is Just so weird. Just standing upright. And uh, you asked Brooklyn, can you, guys, can you trade, trade rooms with mm -hmm. me because I don't like it in here. Yeah. And... Uh, did she ever experience anything? Oh yeah, in there? yeah. She, she wanted did. to trade back after that. Really? So, yeah. Did I trade back? I don't remember. Yeah, I you, did. <laughs> you eventually did. Yep. No. That's but funny. oh, so many things happened that you guys, <laughs> you just guys didn't want to be around there. Did you ever experience anything that feels like it's like any shoulder touches or anything physical? Yeah. Oh, I just touched the microphone. Anything like that physically? really jarred you yeah um i one one thing that really spooked me was that uh one night i got into bed and uh I, my back was to the uh, facing the end of the bed and i was i was still awake i hadn't fallen asleep yet and all of a sudden i felt the only way i can explain it was i felt like somebody sitting down on the bed right next to me because the whole bed went oh, down. Oh, weird. Kind of like the feeling that you get when a, one of your kids is trying to sneak up on you when they put their weight onto the bed mm -hmm. and they're going to they're gonna jump on you. But I knew that all you guys were asleep because it was like 11, 11.30 at night. And, uh, but I felt the bed start to go down, down, down. Mm -hmm. And I whipped around real quick and, and there wasn't anybody or anything oh, there. Oh, weird. And uh, and there's other times I felt a tap here and there over over time. One time I heard a voice right in my ear, and it was uh, what I absolutely thought was Brooklyn. And I was just just coming out of the bedroom, going up the hallway, and right in my like right up against your ear, kind of a thing. I hear Dad. Oh, oh my God! That is and creepy. I'll tell you, I jumped. Yeah, I, I would too. jumped. But it sounded like Brooklyn's that voice. That is so That's weird. so weird. And obviously it wasn't Brooklyn. <laughs> no, that was, wasn't Brooklyn. There was this one time where I went to go take a bath because all of you kids were gone. 
uh, different places, all your friend's house and stuff. So I was, it was in the evening and I was just going to take a leisurely bath. And, um, so I went into the hallway bathroom. I left the door open. I got into the bathtub and, uh, just up the hallway, which would be if, if you, uh, were to face out from the inside of the bathroom to the left was, uh, the laundry room and the living room area. And to the right was down where the bedrooms are, where my bedroom was on Iowa house. Mm, oh yeah. Mm. And, um, so I got in the bathtub and I was relaxing and I had turned the lights off and your mom was up the hall where the laundry room is, um, folding clothes. And, uh, I had said, you know, hey, if somebody comes home, one of the kids or whatever, let me know so I can shut the bathroom door. She said, sure. So she's up there folding clothes. And uh, a few minutes later, our dogs, Gracie and Luke and Bailey, come trotting down the hall. I could, I just watched them go right past the, ba- the bathroom door to the end of the hall where the bedrooms are, wagging their tails. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, why did they do that? Oop. One of the kids got home, and I didn't even know. And so I, I yelled to your mom, and I said, hey, who's home? She said, nobody. And I said, well, where are the dogs going? She said, I don't know. And I said, didn't you just go in the bedroom? She said, no. I'm at the laundry room at the other end of the hall. And then the be- my bedroom light goes click and comes <gasps> on. And the dogs are still standing kind of around, wagging their tails mm-hmm. like they're watching somebody. I'm thinking, well, then who just went into my bedroom? Mm-hmm. And I said, did you just go in the bedroom? She said, no, I'm still folding clothes in the laundry room. Yeah. And I was like, that can't be. So I, I got out of the bathtub and I dried and I got dressed and I went around into the bedroom. And the bedroom door was wide open and the light was on, but there was nobody in there. And... The uh, I was looking around to see if anybody's hiding, somebody's mm-hmm. being funny, did somebody sneak in the house, what is going on? And I only found one thing out of place. I found on my uh, bookshelf next to my side of the bed, I found a single dime. And it was right next to the memorial service pamphlet for your Uncle Tim, my brother. Oh. And... Uh, that was just really weird. Mm-hmm. Well, and what's weird to me is I've experienced things where a dog is in the situation, and the reason that I've experienced something or noticed that something was off was because the dog was aggressively growling and barking and just looking yeah, and in the, it, into the yeah. bathroom, and, in and there was case, no the one in there. And in this case, they're their happy. Tails. Exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. like it couldn't have been a threatening presence yeah. no. if they yeah. were happy and wagging their tails and just nonchalantly, mm-hmm. like, because otherwise. In any yeah. other scenario, your dog is very protective of you, and they want you to know something's going on. You in know? fact, in that same living room with the same dogs, I've had something really weird happen. I was um, sleeping on um, uh, in the living room. I, re- I can't remember. I think it just had the TV on, so I had like a mattress out in the in the in the living room, and and all three dogs were on the mattress with me, and I was just sitting there watching TV. And I think it was probably like ten or eleven at night, and. Uh, um, Luke, the the little uh, little Jack Russell Terrier dog, little guy, he he looks up in the corner, and and I start looking at him, thinking, "What are you looking at?" And he's just staring into the corner, and then all three dogs start staring into the corner, and and I'm thinking, "That's really weird. Why are they just staring in the corner like that?" And then Luke, uh, mainly Luke, but uh, but the rest of them too, it started kind of growling, and then he and, and you can watch him. He's watching the corner of the room, and he starts kind of turning his head and watching the. The whole kind of upper upper corner of the eddies of the of the living room and just following something along the along the ceiling and all three of them are following it. And Luke's growling and and then finally it, it, they start to kind of pick up their pace as to what they're watching and I don't see anything. I'm looking for it and 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 finally they uh, all three of them uh, start growling and barking a lot like viciously like you said, Ren. And uh, they all kind of watched something. I, I mean, they didn't, I didn't see anything, but they followed something down the hallway and barking at it and. And I, yeah, I, I had chills. I was the hair standing up on the back of my neck and just watching. I didn't want to go down the hall just to find out what it was. But the dogs, yeah, they were freaked out by it. But same living room, same dogs. Yeah, so you do remember things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that yeah. I, I think I was 15 when that happened. But You know, and that wasn't the only time those dogs did that. Really? There was a time when I was there that they, they didn't look up at the ceiling, but they were following something mm-hmm. like they were watching it walk through the house. Mm-hmm. And they were growling all three of them, and uh, they followed it 
towards the kitchen where the living room area and the kitchen separates. Mm -hmm. And they stopped right at that line where the kitchen starts. Mm -hmm. And they would not go any closer, but they growled for for a while. And, And I'm standing there right behind them. I can't see a thing. But they were following something and watching it. And then all of a sudden, all three dogs jumped backwards and went, Yipe! Really loud, really? like something had lunged at at him. Oh Yikes! And uh, I, I'm just going, I don't see anything. Yeah. But they definitely saw something that made him jump. Yeah. No, that's all. It's the weirdest feeling, because especially with the dogs, because you know they're not, they don't just pr- play pretend and stare at something weird and random. There, they they were seeing something. They were following something. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember a story that you and Christopher told me about. Really. A time that you, in that same house that uh, I don't remember where I was. I was gone at the time, but you were freaked out. You and Christopher said that you saw somebody walk past that back sliding door wearing a yellow raincoat. Are you sure that was me? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I I, well, I remember Christopher telling me yeah. about it, but I, I okay, thought you Chris had been there. Yeah. And he went running out the back door to see who in the world would be in a raincoat in our backyard. Yeah. and. And it's was a it fenced-in yard. No, it wasn't no. raining, but it was a fenced-in yard, so there's nowhere to go. Yeah. But that shook him up. That's weird. And that kind of thing happened all the time. It's happened ever since I was about eight. Wow. Seven or eight, so. Jeez. Yeah. And there's been times, you know, that have been really spooked me, things that have happened, and other times been kind of humorous. So. Yeah. <laughs> I have a random question. Yeah. Have you ever had dreams of paranormal things happening? Yes. Can you tell us any instant? Do you remember any of them? Um, the the most vivid ones to me are dreams about my brother, my late brother. Mm-hmm. And the weird thing about those dreams are that unlike most dreams that kind of fade off over time, the ones that he have been in have been extremely vivid and I don't forget them. It's, it was like a a real conversation. It's not dream conversations. It's like Mm -hmm. real, Mm -hmm. real things. And it's mostly me like saying, I can't believe you're here. Why are, how are you here? And he would say, you know, um, things are, are a little bit more real than you realize that kind of a thing. And like, What's it like where you're where you're at most of the time? And he would say, I, "You wouldn't understand if I tried to explain what it's like because mm. you don't know it, yeah. what it's like yet. Mm-hmm. You haven't experienced it." So that's interesting. And it's really weird. Mm-hmm. Things like that's that. Really but haunting dreams, I don't really have like ghosts and yeah. mm-hmm. things yeah. like that. But I had my one time uh, when Mark and I went to Texas. <clears throat> Um, we were sleeping in the van in my grandma's garage and I remember we fell asleep and I remember my dream was one of the most vivid dreams I've had in years. And my grandpa came to me in my dream and he gave me a hug and I I hadn't seen him since he passed, you know, and in my dream, he pretty much told me, he was like, everything's going to be okay. I'm watching over your grandma every day and I'm here with her. She's not alone because she lives alone in her house. And Um, My grandma actually had spread my grandpa's ashes in the backyard in where the tree was in the backyard. And I just remember that dream was, I don't usually have such vivid dreams as much anymore now that I'm older. And I feel like that dream was just so vivid. And I remember just crying and crying when I woke up because it was so realistic. And I had felt like he was actually visiting me, talking to me. And like you said, it was like I was having a vivid conversation with him and it wasn't like, in like the dream world, how everything kind of just blurs and it's not so like when you wake up, it just kind of dissipates. And when I woke up, Mm -hmm. it just was so vivid and it was so real. And I remember going directly into the house and it was the first night that we had stayed with my grandma in that stay that we were staying there. And I remember going in the house and I just started crying and it was just so realistic. And I told her everything that I saw and I told her that he was watching over and it was just so weird because 
my family doesn't really, I've never had experiences like paranormal type experiences with my family members or anything like that. And so it was so interesting to me that the first night we had stayed there and I had, it had been weighing on my heart a lot that my grandma's living alone and stuff. And it was just so, so comforting seeing him and him vividly saying, hey, don't worry, I'm here and I'm with her and she's not alone. So you don't have to be afraid for her anymore. You know, I got a crazy story. Um, so, uh, this happened, I want to say 2011 or 12, maybe something. Um, I was in Ellensburg and, um, above the old school's record store, uh, we do all sorts of shows there and stuff. Um, and, uh, Threads and Needles, the piercing place, there's this, uh, like, a, a apartment buildings and stuff. Um, and they're, um, they're, they're old. It's an old building, old downtown area. And, uh, um... A lot of weird things I, I've heard over the years happen and stuff like that. But uh, So a friend lived up there, and I went up there and hung out. And, and they said, uh, they were telling me about, oh, this creepy room that's in here. You, you don't want to see it. I don't even ever want to go there ever again. And, and I was uh, sitting there going, what? This sounds intriguing. Let's go check this out. And and, uh, um, and then the friend that was telling me about it said, nope, I am not going up there. Absolutely not. Never again. That's the creepiest thing I've ever seen or ever been in it. And, um their friend uh that was that was living with them said oh yeah i'll take you sure why not and and so uh we we go over to this like janitor's closet thing uh and and when we open the when you, you open the door it, it's it's like a land uh, uh it's like a, it was like a closet a, b- a bigger closet it was it was pretty large actually it was like a it had really high ceilings and like uh it was probably maybe 15 feet wide by by another 15 feet maybe but then there's this like staircase in the loft up to the right and uh, um and uh so you go when we go in there, we initially I feel kind of like weird going in there. It's kind of an odd place, but I'll tell you, going up those steps. As soon as we started walking up the steps, the 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 higher and higher you get, the weirder and weirder you start. It just starts feeling really off and really weird. And uh, um, uh, I've never felt. It was kind of like a vertigo almost. Like I felt like like I was really really high up in the air, and I and and by the time we actually get to the top of the loft and walked up. Uh, up t- into the loft, it, you're you're up almost to where the ceiling is essentially. I mean, you're standing up straight, but the ceiling's right there, so you're you're, you're like you know almost another story up. Um, really high ceilings. Uh, when we get there uh, to the top of the loft, um, I, it almost feels like uh, when you look at the floor, almost like you're looking down like from a really really high place. It feel really like vertigo. You really feel super high up there, and it feels like one step you're gonna fall through the floor or something, and. Uh, I started getting these creepy feelings about this this place, and my the friend that's take take taking me up there said, "Yeah, the the uh, the guy who had managed the building um, was like the the property manager had uh, built like kind of like a, a home of his own inside of this little closet thing. It was really weird, and and uh, and apparently he was like a meth addict and and and, and um, installed like cameras inside of the separate apartments and could see what the other." Uh, uh, tenants were doing like, in their apartments and stuff. It was really weird. Anyway, so um, if you look around this room in this loft when you're first up there, you can see all these different mirrors on all these different walls. And uh, I mean, that's just a weird feeling in and of itself. But walking through and seeing yourself and seeing yourself through another mirror behind you and just all these. Why were there so many mirrors on the walls? It's so strange. Um, and there was all sorts of weird things lying around, just objects and just stuff. And and uh, um, so. You start to walk through, and um, the, instead of instead of being like a normal apartment or a house or something like that, you know how like a normal apartment or house you go through. There's a living room. There's you know there's different. Uh, but this had like a, that that loft when you first were in there with all these mirrors, and then there was a hallway, and you go in the hallway, and it would turn to the right, and then to the left, and then to the left again, and then to the right again, and it was like this maze. It was weird. It was just kept going, and you, so you walk through these different hallways. And the the person who was with me brought me to the back of the very back of this whole weird apartment thing. This whole time walking through, the, I'm just feeling creepy, creeped out, weirdest, most, almost like someone's watching you. Uh, some it just felt really wrong, really, really wrong. It didn't feel like a little bit wrong. It felt very wrong. I mean, it felt really weird. And so we get to the back, and it, there was this like bathroom thing. It had a toilet in it, but. It was like it was more focused. The room was more focused around like this bathtub, and this and in the in the opposite corner of the bathtub there was this like TV mounted on the wall where the guy would watch the tenants in their in oh their house. And he would just be hanging out in this bathtub. It was really really weird. And th- this whole 
apartment thing inside this closet, this storage closet. I don't know how to describe it. It was just the creepiest, weirdest feeling. I mean, nothing really actually happened while we were there, there but the reason I always mention this story and talk about it, though, is because it just felt, like, really evil. Like, it just felt really, really, really wrong in that place. You just, and I had to, I had to get out of there. I, it wasn't even a matter of, you know, kind of moseying my way back through and looking at a few things. When I was ready to go, I was leaving fast. I was scurrying my way out of there because I felt like something was falling behind me or something. But it was weird. That was probably the creepiest place I have ever been. So I've been to some weird places, but that that was weird. That was really strange. It didn't have normal appliances. It wasn't like a normal place that you'd be. It was some, something that resembled like a lair of somebody that would you know, a creepy person would live in. Yeah, you never know what might have been going on in a place like yeah, that. Yeah, like what other weird things. Yeah. Probably one of the the most in-your-face things that I had happen was that we had a, a little air conditioner in the bedroom that had a remote control. And uh, if you didn't have the remote control to turn it on and off, like when you're in the bed, it could get really annoying. You have to get up, mm-hmm. manually turn it off. Because we had to turn it off every once in a while just to let it thaw out so to speak and because it would be it would get condent condensation and it would drip everywhere all, all over the bedroom and uh so it was just much easier to use that remote control and one day it just was all of a sudden gone we couldn't find it and we thought well maybe absentmindedly we put it down and and uh forgot about where we put it so we searched the house we searched every possible area mm-hmm. Never did find that thing. No way. So it was, uh, I don't know, two, three weeks later of having to do it manually. Mm -hmm. One night I uh, came into the bedroom and your mom was laying in bed and I, uh, uh, she asked me to go get her glass of water or whatever. So I picked up her glass off of the end table right next to her, next to the bed. And I went into the bathroom, filled the water into the glass, came back out, and she said, where'd you find it? And I said, find what? She said, the remote to the the air conditioner. And I said, I didn't. What are you talking about? She said, yeah, it's right here on the dresser, right next to me, where I had just picked up that glass. Oh, my gosh. And I didn't find that thing. But all of a sudden, there it was. <laughs> And uh, that was really, really weird. That is weird. Right but probably, probably the weirdest one was your grandma and grandpa lived about 40 miles from us in Yakima when we were in Ellensburg. And um, there was a period where your grandpa, he went into the bathroom to brush his teeth one morning and his toothbrush wasn't there. And he yelled for my mom, hey, did you take my toothbrush for anything? And she was like, no, why would I need your toothbrush? And he says, well, it's not in the bathroom because he would just set it in a like a coffee cup that mm-hmm. sat in the cabinet. And it was gone. And she said, well, maybe you just absentmindedly put it somewhere. And he was, no, I'm, but I'll look. And they looked all over the house, never found that toothbrush. Wow. And so they went out and bought him a new one. And probably, I don't know, two weeks later, it happened again. Where's my toothbrush? Just, <laughs> Missing. And she's like, I wouldn't take your toothbrush. Yeah. And so they never found it. And so they went and got a, a third toothbrush. And <clears throat> um, next morning when they got up, my dad went into the bathroom and say, comes out saying, Judy, there's something wrong with my toothbrush. And she said, oh, no, not missing again. He said, no, come look. So she came into the bathroom, and not only was his toothbrush still there, but in that cup next to it was a second toothbrush. <gasps> but that was one neither of them had ever seen before. <gasps> what? what the heck? Never seen. Oh, that's so And it was weird. just sitting in, the, in that cup. Well, probably a couple weeks later, I mean, that, that quit, that died down. A couple weeks later, they said, they called me and said, hey, we want to come up on Saturday and have lunch with you guys. And, oh, great. So we decided to meet at Perkins. Mm-hmm. They drove all the way up to Ellensburg. And, um, but the night before that happened, we were sitting in the living room watching TV and uh, in, in Ellensburg, uh, your mom and I, and I got up from the couch, 
went in, walked through the the uh, dining living room area into the kitchen mm -hmm. to grab a glass of milk and something to eat. And I grabbed it and I came back towards the couch. But as I came back, there's a toothbrush <gasps> laying what? in the middle of oh the the floor in and Ellensburg, forty in, in Ellensburg. And I'm thinking, uh, why is there a toothbrush laying there? I've never seen this before. And then I remembered what my mom and dad were going through. So I thought, nah, they're coming for lunch tomorrow. I'm going to be funny. So I, I put it in a little baggie and stuck it in my pocket. Was and it your dad? The next morning when we went and met for lunch, we were just sitting around talking and all that. And I remembered, oh, I've got this toothbrush. Mm -hmm. So I picked this toothbrush out and I pulled it out and said, this is the weirdest thing. Look what I found in the middle of my floor, dining room or living room floor last night. And my mom looks at it and says, Huh, that looks like one of the ones your dad lost. <gasps> oh, oh my so gosh. Weird. That's so far and, away, uh, too. 40 miles away. And weird. no. What and I heck? and I had her look, are you sure? Are you sure? She said, yeah, that looks like one of the ones that was missing. No explanation for that. Weird. No, I don't even have a guess. That is so crazy. How odd. Oh, what about uh, the fax phone that was in the be bedroom? Oh, yeah. Was, so what was the story on that one? I would stay occasionally overnight because my commute was 40 miles each way to work mm -hmm. and back. And to sort of save on gas and cut down on expenses, sometimes, you know, occasionally I'd stay the night in, in at their house in mm -hmm. Yakima. And one night I was staying there. It was in the basement in the little bedroom, extra bedroom downstairs. My mom had an old fax machine that she had hooked up to a phone number that was generated for the fax machine. It wasn't mm -hmm. in any phone books. Nobody knew the number. It was just a phone number. And uh, <clears throat> during this time, your Uncle Tim and your grandpa had a lot of really spooky, weird stuff happening where they worked at the Napa Auto Place. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, I've, there's stories after stories. After at the things, Napa. <laughs> things happen at Napa with them that freak them out and stuff. But so this night I'm staying in that little bedroom and about middle of the night somewhere I hear this <laughs> phone ringing and I I thought it was their their home phone and I'm thinking nobody calls in the middle of the night unless it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. So I got up and I stumbled around and uh um I realized, wait a minute, that's not the phone. That's this fax machine ringing. Who would be sending a fax yeah. at, you know, at middle of the night? That was weird. And, uh, but I, I thought, you know, that's that's just dumb. But I, I thought, so many weird things have happened. Just for fun, I'm going to find out who it was that tried to fax. So what I did was I picked up, it had this little telephone. You could actually use it as a telephone too if you want. Mm -hmm. But nobody knew this number. Nobody cared about this number. It was just a fax machine. Mm -hmm. And so I picked the phone up and I dialed the star, I think it's star 69, where you, mm -hmm. the last number that dialed you oh, is. Yep. Mm -hmm. And here I am half asleep and I just wrote down this number that called. And I stuck the, the piece of paper in my pocket for, t for the morning and then I forgot about it went back to sleep. Next day, I'm at work. It's probably in the middle of the day somewhere, and I had to reach into my pocket for something, and there's a piece of paper, and I'm thinking, what is a piece of paper doing in my pocket? So I pulled it out, and it's it's a phone number. And I realized, oh, yeah, that was that phone number that called that fax machine to wake me up in the middle of the night. And I thought, uh, let's find out who tried to yeah, call. So I, I dialed the number. Do, 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 do. And they pick up the phone. Good morning. Welcome to Seal and Napa Auto Supply. How can we help you? Oh, my gosh. And it was their work that tried Calling to call fax this machine. fax machine that nobody knew the number for. What? And that was just weird. And that's the same Napa that they worked at and that, that has all sorts of creepy things happening. Yep. That, that was the same so word. Oh. Yeah. Uh, this last story is also in your book, right? Or oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Shoot. Well, it was a time that um, your Uncle Ken, who was always intrigued with um, all the stories that, that I've had all through my life. Now, and the interesting thing is that we all experienced it as a, as a family when I was young. Oh, wow. And, but when we grew up and we all split ways and we all had our own families, most of the time my brothers, and I say most of the time, not never, but most of the time very little 
happened with them. It, but it always continued with me over the years. And so that really intrigued my brother Ken. And uh, during a particularly um, busy time of these things happening, he wanted to see for himself, can I experience it, any of it, and see if it really happens? You know, mm -hmm. I, I want to see if it really is happening. I want to see. So he decided to come over one night <clears throat> and uh, bring his uh, son, Jared, and they were going to stay in the house to see if anything happened that oh, night. Oh, I think I remember this. So they came over, and uh, they took the two couches out in the living room to see if anything would happen. And in the middle of the night... He woke up to some sounds, so he sat up on the couch, and he very clearly heard footsteps coming down the hallway, turning and going up the stairs towards your guys' bedrooms, and he heard a little bit of moving around. Then he heard the footsteps come back down the stairs, and there's enough light, like moonlight and street lights outside that you could see a sh at least a shadow walking through mm -hmm. if it was a person and he's sitting there staring right at where this is happening in the hallway and he's hearing the footsteps coming down the stairs and down the hallway turning the corner and going into that bath this is in Rainier mm -hmm. the Rainier house ba and going into that bathroom and then stopping and he got up went around the corner and into that bathroom and flipped on the light and there's Nothing. Nobody there. He didn't see anything. He didn't um, see anything when it was happening. He didn't see anything when he turned on the lights. Nothing. And Jared, of course, was awake during this whole thing, too. And when Ken came around the corner, um, Jared asked him, Was it somebody? Who was it? And uh, my brother said, There's nothing here. And Jared said, Well, I think I'm going home. <laughs> I'm never coming back here again. I'm not doing this. And Jared never came back to that to the house really? again. But Ken just was absolutely stunned by that because mm -hmm. he got to actually experience some of the stuff that we were having. You guys heard it. This is my father, Andy Passion, on Ragged Bones by Robbers Roost. Thanks for hanging out and Thanks telling us some spooky this. stories. Thanks for having me. It was yeah. it's always fun to be with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for tuning in. If you'd like to seek out or support any of the artists we've hosted today, we've attached links to this episode. We're pretty darn hardworking artists ourselves, so if you'd like to show us some love and support, you can find us through our music, Robber's Roost. Hey, check out our Patreon. It's probably the best way to support us. Also, check us out on social media because we plan to release these every Tuesday. Spill the beans, Ren. Search for Robber's Roost, podcast or band on any platform. We got merch, tour dates, and all the fun stuff. Ragged Bones from Broken Homes. This has been another episode with Mark. And Renegade. Stay tuned, folks. Is that a musician joke?